What's going on everybody, it's Javon.ca and we are here again for another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K, where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand a month. Now, I'm sitting with none other than John Coley, the founder of Rescue7. You know those defibrillators? They sell them all across Canada. They do first aid training, a bunch of different education for your business and all your employees. I'm really excited to hear about how he went from a firefighter and changed to starting his business and now sells products all across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to introduce you to none other than John Coley. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, thanks so much for being with us today. It's an honor. And I'm so excited to learn more about you, your story and where it is that you came from. So maybe we could start with that. You know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about who is John Coley. Well, uh, I started out as a firefighter when I was a young guy. Uh, with, uh, with Scarborough Fire Services at the time that we amalgamated the Toronto Fire Department or Toronto Fire Service. I worked on a heavy rescue vehicle for, I guess, uh, about 16 out of my 20 year career. So I got to learn a lot of different uh, um, disciplines, uh, confined space, high angle rescue, auto extrication. Um, so it was very interesting. Uh, while I was working at the fire service, we were going to many calls. And when you go to these calls, you know, a lot of them were medical calls. And we come into an, uh, a, 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 maybe an office, maybe a home, and somebody would be in distress. They would be in a, maybe a cardiac emergency, uh, whatnot. And you'd have a lot of people standing around not knowing what to do. Mm. So I thought, you know what, if we could train the masses out there in what to do in a medical emergency, the more lives we'll have saved. So I started the company Rescue 7, and that was 26 years ago. Wow. So when you see a problem like this, you know, not a lot of people just think, okay, I'm going to start this business and it's going to change lives, right? Well, maybe that might be the initial thought or the initial desire, but what were some of your first moves at that point? Some of my first moves, well, let's just say it was, uh, you know, every firefighter, it seems, has another, uh, uh, you know, side job, they call it, okay. to keep them busy and, and to do something that they're passionate about. Um, you know, I saw a need that, you know, saving lives was, uh, you know, we could create ways to help people save more lives out there. So um, I, you know, initially started this organization. Uh, it was a one, I was a one person show working out of a basement, you know, and, and I, back in 1997, I actually had to buy computer for dummies and, you know, figure out how to work a keyboard. And, um, and then I, you know, I got a couple of uh, contracts and it started growing from there. People liked what we were doing. I think they saw that there was a passion there. Uh, everybody in our organization now, most of them are firefighters, uh, paramedics, nurses and that. So it adds a lot of credibility to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, cause we're experienced, we're professionals. Uh, we do this for a living, but, um, you know, when I first started, it was, again, it was a side gig. Yeah. Like a lot of uh, firefighters do, but then it kept growing on me to the point where, you know, I was burning the candle at both ends, working uh, fire you know, as a firefighter, working here at Rescue 7 and, you know, trying to manage a family with my wife. And we had four young children at the time. Uh, actually, when I started the company, we only had two young children and one on the way because <laughs> uh, our next guy was born in 1998. And then our last guy was tw 2001. So, um, yeah, you know, it was, it was kind of burning the candle at both ends in 2007. Um, I was uh, I was um, on Dragon's Den and did a did a episode 11, season three, I think it was. And the phone started just going crazy after that. So I had to make a decision because I was just getting too busy and there was a lot going on. So I had to make a decision whether I stay as a firefighter or I take it to the next level, Rescue 7. And uh, a lot of people thought I was crazy, especially my uh, my crewmates on, on the fire service thinking, John, you got a great secure job, got full benefits, you got four young ones at home. Yeah. And uh, this, you know, it's a very risky move what you're doing. Yeah. But I, I saw a need for it. And I, you know, and I'm glad I did it because today here we are. Um, we're much bigger and we're out there saving more lives. So it's all good. So this must have been a, how many years was this a side gig for? So I started with the fire service in 88 and I left in uh, just before 2008. So it was 19 plus years. Yeah. So I started the company in 98. Yeah. And so, you know, it was, uh, it was nine years of, uh, working both or eight and a half before I left. Wow. And, and it, I, I could mirror that feeling of having your, your colleague saying, what, you're crazy for doing this, but it's, it's nuts when you could see it so clearly and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to make this jump. But, uh, then John, do you remember the first time you made a hundred grand in a year? 
<laughs> well, I sure do. Uh, you know, when I first started the organization, I, I had a dear friend who was an executive with a big corporation, so I kind of leaned on him for advice and and business uh, direction. As I'm not, I wasn't a business guy. I was, you know, I was a firefighter. Yeah. And I'm more of an entrepreneur. I like to say. So uh, I took him out for lunch the one day, and when I started my company, he said to me, you know what, I wish you a lot of luck. We've talked about a business plan and everything. He said, because you're going to find the first $100,000 that you'll earn will be the hardest $100,000 you'll earn moving forward. Was he right? And he was oh, so right, because nobody knew who Rescue 7 was. They all thought St. John and Red Cross were the two go-to places that, you know, you wanted to get some medical training. And so it was, uh, it was very hard for the first year or two. Mm-hmm. But then after, you know, the second year I went back to him and I said, okay, I made a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. I think I'm onto something. And he said, do you know what? The next step is the, the hardest one you're going to find now is to make a million dollars. Okay. So I went out, made, you know, took a couple of years, uh, three, four years, got to that million dollar mark, went back to him and he said, okay, what about five million? I said, you're just going to keep doing this to me. <laughs> and I, and he said, yes, I am. Because it's, you know, it's, uh, people don't r- realize, you know, a, a business is like your second family and, you know, mm. you live and eat and breathe it. And, and, you know, we, uh, you know, know that I have, uh, colleagues that work with me. Mm. I treat them as family and, yeah. uh, and we're building something that we believe in. So mm. I tell anybody, you know, when I made that first hundred thousand dollars back in 1999, 2000, I was like, "Wow!" And it was great that I made the money, but you also, you know, to grow it, you have to have a passion. Yeah. And it's like I tell my four kids now, who are all grown, when they're going through university and all and everything, being educated, I said, "Guys, listen, it doesn't matter to me what you want to do in life. Just make sure you love what you do, mm. because you know it's uh, something that you're gonna have to do the rest of your life." And it was interesting because I'm now part of a global group called Safe Life. Uh, and uh, we are, our headquarters are in Sweden now, in Stockholm. And uh, when I first joined on with the, the, the team there, the uh, two guys that started Safe Life, they said to me, how much do you work? And I kind of chuckled at them. I said, I don't work. And they said, what do you mean you don't work? And I said, if you call going to the office every day and playing in a sandbox and building castles, then I guess that's work. But to me, I don't consider it work. I consider it a passion. Wow. And so what was the first kind of product that you were selling at the time? Because now, like, you got pamphlets that you're printing you got defibrillators that are mailing all over the place you got a whole team doing all sorts of things you know what did it what did it start as so we started as a training organization 1998 okay. we wanted to go out and train as i mentioned train the masses mm-hmm. the more people learn what to do in cpr or in choking incident or a di- diabetic situation or an allergy you know going in seizures whatever uh, the more lives would be saved and so the more mm-hmm. you know people can help on the front lines till 9-1 arrives Mm -hmm. and uh unfortunately when i was on the fire service we were doing a study at the time and i know fellow uh uh, you know ems uh, personnel don't like hearing this but the average response time usually for anybody to get to a scene is 8.1 minutes Mm -hmm. so you got that eight minute span what do we do with that person in eight minutes because for somebody in a cardiac arrest for every minute that you don't defibrillate them their chance for survival decreased by 10 percent wow so we got a 10 minute window to work there so Mm -hmm. the more we can get defibrillators out but i started off as a training organization and then uh while i was working at the fire service i got seconded in to work uh as a, a shift training instructor we call it with defibrillators yeah and back in those days everybody thought what's a defibrillator no a lot of people couldn't even say the word never mind spell it yeah a defibril <laughs> what and uh so they were like wow what is this thing and when i first you know got introduced to these machines i was like this is brilliant like this is this is what we need out there now so now mm-hmm. we're out there training people why can't they use the defibrillator mm-hmm. so you know the manufacturers came up with public access defibrillators which were very easy to use and that's when i said okay we got to get these out now to the masses so now going into corporations working with you know one of my first big accounts was was working with rogers and i went in to see in the boardroom mr rogers himself wow. with his uh, dr be. bernie gosevich and uh mr rogers was like do am i required to have these by law no nope. You're not required at all. But uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gosevich said, you know, Mr. Rogers, these are life-saving devices. I think we should look at, you know, putting them into our, deploying them into our workplace. So they bought five units to start with us, which back in the day were five, $6,000 a unit. Mm. And, uh, you know, about three months later, they had one of their employees going to cardiac arrest on the second floor at wow. Mount Pleasant. And they saved her with a defibrillator. Wow. And that's when Mr. Rogers called me and said, John, I see the need for these. I want them all over now. So today we have 245 units in Rogers alone wow. uh, in their locations, 245 defibrillators, and we do their training for them in first aid. Wow. So how did you even get connected 
to someone like Mr. Rogers, for example. So when people start their business, they're like, okay, I don't have any connections, <laughs> right? So how would you go about telling the old John that has no connections? Here's how you go get some. Well, it's funny, uh, the, the funny story when I first started my company, uh, my wife's uncle, uh, who I will be seeing another month from now again because he's down in Florida, so I'm going to go visit him, Uncle Ron. He uh, worked, uh, he was an accountant, with okay. a big, one of the big accounting firms. And uh, so when I first started my company, I, I needed business, like you said. I'm like, who do I call? What do I do? Yeah. So I said, because you, you're a firefighter, right? You're like, I had to go, the phone rings. Like, I don't pick up yeah. the phone and call. The phone wasn't anybody. ringing for me. <laughs> we knew who Rescue 7 was. I didn't think I just built a website and it was yeah. very. Uh, uh, yeah, it was the beginnings. Anyway, I said to my wife, I need Uncle Ron's phone number because I want to call and see his accounting firm needs first aid training. And she was like, you can't do that. I, I can't, you know, I don't feel comfortable giving out Uncle Ron's phone number for you to solicit him to, for business. So she wouldn't give it to me. So I went to her mother. So I went to her, <laughs> my mother-in-law, I said, I called her one day. I said, I need Uncle Ron's phone number. I didn't tell her why. And she said, oh, yeah, here it is. I said, great. So I called Uncle Ron at work one day, and unfortunately, he was away on business, but I got his uh, assistant. I'll never forget her name, Dipna O'Byrne. Shout out, Dipna. Good, good, good Irish name. Yeah. And uh, called her, told her what I was calling about, and uh, she said, let me see what I can do for you. Uh, we'll get back to you in the next day or two. I got a phone call from her with, like, three days later and said, Uncle Ron says that they need training at one Canadian place downtown wow. for all their employees and first aid, wow. and you got to start of a contract. So I got a $5,000 contract to start. And I was like, wow, here we go. Yeah. So I went in front of a bunch of accountants, taught them first aid, and they loved it. That it, They spun it off to different offices and it grew. And then I started growing my company. Wow. That's crazy. How did that first 5,000 feel? Oh, f fantastic. <laughs> Probably the best 5,000 you ever felt. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you got to be profitable to run yeah. an organization and you, you want to make money for sure. Mm -hmm. But again, I always like to go back to, it's always related to us going out there and helping people and trying to, you know, get more lives saved. Yeah, 100%. So it, is, that a, is that a stat that you track these days? Like how many people were saved with your defibrillators, for example? Yeah, we do. We, because uh, when it gets used, they have to replace the pads and battery and everything. Okay. So last year alone, we had 29 saves around Canada. Wow. And, you know, every time that phone rings and we hear that there's a save, that, make, that makes the hair on my arms stand up. And mm -hmm. we have competitors, so that's 29 for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you take four or five competitors, you add those up, 150 lives, more lives are saved than would have been saved if we didn't you know would not have been saved if we didn't have these defibrillators out there in the public 100 percent. so it's uh it's a, it's a very important mission that i think you're after and what's been interesting to learn after so many shows is that it's never really about the money you know it's there's always a mission behind it there's always some something that's driving you and uh thank you for sharing yours now john you remember the first time you made 100 grand in a month yeah that would have been uh the the first 100 in a month would have been around 2010 or 12 and that would have been with a client that's a grocery store chain in canada and so what did you we won't say any names but was it in defibrillator sales was it in training at at this point what is the product suite look it was like? a defibrillator sales okay Yes. And how did how did it sort of evolve? So we started as training, then we went immediately into defibrillator sales. Yeah, they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Because, you know, people, when we first started selling defibrillators, a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to put, turn, take that off the wall because I don't know what to do with it. Mm. And can I be held liable? Mm -hmm. So we thought, hey, if we train you what to do with it, mm -hmm. then you don't, won't need to worry. And fortunately, in 2007, the Heart and Stroke Foundation took notice of what was going on with these defibrillators. And they passed the law. Well, they got, received a grant from our provincial government to put defibrillators in schools and hockey rinks wow. around the province. And they said, we'd love to, but if we put it on the wall, people might think, well, I don't know how to use it and I could be held liable. So they came back and introduced uh, Bill 171, okay. better known as the Chase McEachern Act for a small boy that unfortunately passed away. And if there had been a defibrillator uh, present at his school, he might have been saved. And that bill states that anyone in Ontario can use a defibrillator and not be held liable. Um, and it also goes one step further in saying that if you're an owner of a defibrillator and you put it on that wall, so mm -hmm. if you're a grocery store chain or a car dealership or a dentist office and you put it on that wall and it gets used, as long as you maintain the defibrillator and uh, maintain a good standing, you can't be held liable. Hmm. So it's protecting everybody now. And, and of course, that 
law kind of domino affected right across the country and we see yeah. it across the country these laws wow. and in the states now you'll see it's even mandatory if you go into certain states like california they're mandatory to have them in every school wow they're, you know it's mandated that they have to be in every pool in every fitness club mm -hmm. and we're, i think we're going to eventually get there and see that in canada yeah so how did how did a law being passed change your business your phone probably ran off the hook after that didn't need to call Uncle Ron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's still, it, it, it was, you know, it was five, six years of pounding the pavement, mm -hmm. getting out there, getting into boardrooms, getting into organizations, condo associations, everything, explaining yeah. to them what this unit looks like, how easy, once you see it in action and you put your hands on it and feel it and play with it and, you know, how easy it is. Yeah. And then they say, wow, that's so simple. Uh -huh. Because before they think, oh, they, they, you know, when I first started, they thought the movies, you get the paddles out and yeah, clear everybody <laughs> and poof and, yeah. you know, and the stand back. And, and we're like, no, 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 it's not like that at all. It's yeah. very simple to use. And, uh, and you know, the, the quicker we can get it on somebody, the, the better chance we have of them, uh, you know, of, the, of a save. So how has your role changed? So when you started... You're the, probably the one doing sales. You're the one that's going in and teaching, teaching the course, right? And then over time, I'm sure things started getting busy, right? First couple of years, uh, yeah, one man band. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're, you're staying up at night and you're, you're soliciting, you're going on the internet, finding companies, sending out sales packages, everything, uh, trying to email, you know, the health and safety director or the, you know, the, um, uh, health and say, uh, the, uh, the, um, human resources director, whoever's, you know, running that, that part for their organization. Mm -hmm. And then they tell getting up. And if I'm not at the fire station, I was out training every day. Yeah. And, you know, I, I got to the point where I was, you know, kind of, it was growing and I, okay, I need some help. Mm -hmm. So I went to a couple of other firefighters and I said, hey, guys, like, you know, want to come train with me? And it's a it's a fun gig. Uh, you know, some of them were, you know, doing renovations and they're getting older. Their back's kind of hurting, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, no, you're going to be in a classroom standing up in front of, you know, 20 people yeah. teaching them a life saving skills. Yeah. And they said, yeah, I think we can do that. So then, you know, a couple of them joined on and then it just grew from there. So and then uh, unfortunately, I, I used to love getting in front of a group and teaching. Yeah. And everybody thinks, you know, because. Oh, well, I know because I saved lives with the defibrillators and I know how to teach this, but teaching is a skill set. Yeah. And you got to know how to, you know, get your, you want to get your message across to everybody in that room mm -hmm. so that they come out and they're in their comfort zone when there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. So it is a skill set. So we bring on, you know, we vet out who are good teachers mm -hmm. um, th through our sources. And uh, so unfortunately, I don't get to teach at all anymore because I'm, yeah. I'm now in the office and overseeing our team and overseeing sales and overseeing a warehouse and etc so as much as i'd like to get out and teach but uh but we you know what we have uh, uh over 100 contracted instructors around the country in every urban center and they're all we have a very good quality assurance program so they're all excellent teachers so we're, we're in good hands wow which uh when was the last time you taught a course uh, it'd be at least seven eight nine years ago wow um i do a lot of presentations i'm in yeah. you know i'm presenting to a lot of organizations and mm -hmm. and uh, doing i do one hour uh lunch and learn type deals with companies just to, you know see show them what the defibrillator is all about etc yeah but to teach a full first aid program it's been a been a few it's years a while, unfortunately. Eh? so how does that lunch and learn kind of tie into the business is that kind of like at the beginning now like at the beginning of a relationship you would kind of start with the lunch and learn and then pass it off yeah, it could be, mm -hmm. uh, or it could be that, you know, they've been in there, uh, for example, I play in, uh, a, a, in a men's hockey league, or as my three boys at home would call it, dad's old timers hockey, let's get real. Timers, eh? And uh, so, you know, you never know what's going to happen there. So uh, I just talked to the guy that runs our league just the other day, and we're organizing, a, I call it lunch and learn, a seminar, one hour seminar before we go on the ice mm. in two weeks. So I want to show everybody, this is where the defibrillators are located in the rink. This is how to use them. Cool. This is what you need to do. Still call 911, turn it on, start CPR. So they're comfortable. So if something does happen to any of yeah. us, they'll, they, and they, there's a call to action. They'll know what to do. Wow, man, that's really impressive. Now, which part so far has been kind of like the, the most difficult part of the climb? Oh, definitely, the, you know, the early years. I mean... First 10 years, there's a lot of sweat equity that goes into this. And yeah. uh, to grow it to a national level, um, you know, working with our, our global team now, I was just down in Nashville with them last week. You have to make them realize that Canada is a big country. 
Yeah. And Jeez. you know, so over in Germany, our our, our partner there, with two hours on, on any autobahn, and they're where they need, where they need to be in Germany. Yeah. You know, country. and and that's eighty eight million people yeah. too. We have thirty six million, not even the size of California. And for me to go to Vancouver to do a presentation or try to make a sale, that's a ten hour plane flight, five hours there and back. Uh-huh. So it takes up a lot of your time. So yeah. the first uh, ten years was pounding the pavement, mm-hmm. getting out there, letting people know you're rep- reputable, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that, uh, you know, I, I always went in thinking, I don't want to do a, an immediate sale. I want to do sales with you for the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. I want to handshake and I want you to be happy with our services mm-hmm. for the next 10. It's not about the get in there, make a sale and get on to the next one. Yeah. I, I want that relationship building uh, to happen over time mm-hmm. so that, you know, they've been with us for, uh, we've had clients now that have been with us for 12, 15, 16, even 20 years, which wow. is great. And so what does that look like? Because you might think like a defibrillator and a training is like a one-time thing. Well, the defibrillators do have the accessories on the defibrillator, they do have rollovers. So okay. the pads and the battery have to be switched out every four years. If it mm-hmm. gets used in an emergency, we have to change them out. So there's that rollover there. Mm-hmm. Training wise, uh, the, the requirements uh, right across Canada with the CSA, and if you go to different provinces and their requirements, uh, you your training expires every three years. Uh, so it rolls over again. So we okay. uh, have a lot of national clients that are very large where you know you go through the training for three years and when you hit at the end of three years you start again because the three years are up from the first round yeah. so we start them over again huh that's very interesting and was it always that way or did it kind of just evolve naturally over time to something like this no it's always been like that okay and uh so you know back in the day actually even when i got into this the you know the only two training organizations really that were out there were red cross and st john's and everybody knows yeah. them yeah so when i was calling on clients and that they'd say oh well which one are you affiliated with red cross or st john's mm-hmm. well i'm not i'm affiliated with rescue seven yeah and they're like rescue and i said yeah we're fully approved just like the rest of- i mean mm-hmm. it took me half a year a year to write all the curriculum the manuals to put together mm-hmm. and everything and go to the provincial regulators and get them approved yeah and then once we were approved we were on the same level as the other two so we thought okay now you know uh let's get out there and show people what we have yeah now do you want to tell us where the name rescue seven came from Rescue 7 comes from a, the heavy rescue vehicle that I said at the beginning of this, uh, I was on for 15, 16 years. Uh, when I was a Scarborough firefighter, I got assigned to Rescue 7. Um, it was at Hall 7 in Scarborough. We had an aerial truck, aerial 7, a pumper truck, pumper 7, and a district chief's car there, and we had the rescue. And so what happened was when I started the company, I was trying to look for a name. And uh, my wife actually was a high school teacher. She's now retired. She went into her classroom one day and said to her grade 11 English class, hey, you know, my husband's starting this company for first aid training and he's looking for a name. And we were thinking like Lifesavers or, you know, Life something. Savers. We we're like, nah, that's, you know, kind of You get corny. sued too quickly. We wanted something else. And uh, so this uh, one, uh, one student, he came, he first he went up to my wife after class and said, I thought your husband's a firefighter. And yes, he is. Well, what truck is he on? Rescue 7. So we mm-hmm. went and researched it, came back the next day with the logo and the name Rescue 7. Wow. And uh, she came home with it and I said, that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to call it. Rescue. There's some history to that. So, yeah. so it's always stuck. That's cool. Now, do you remember the first time you made a hundred grand in a day? Uh, yes, that would be... Uh, <laughs> That would be just a couple of years ago, okay. and it was a, with a, another big uh, chain in Canada, and we uh, deployed uh, we deployed over thirteen hundred defibrillators with them. Thirteen hundred defibrillators. Yes, we Holy. did. What did it take to fulfill that? It was a little bit of work, but yeah. it, on both sides. Uh, but mm-hmm. we made it work for them, and uh, they're in all their stores now, and mm-hmm. they've had a couple of saves actually. So we're very proud of that. Wow. Now. If you were to go back and talk to the old John, right? Do you think he would believe? If you were to tell him, like, "Yeah, we've got one company with thirteen hundred. How many do you think you have deployed across Canada right we now? We have over thirty-five thousand units deployed across Canada right now. And what about the states and other countries? So we're not allowed to. So with the, the licensing here, we're, okay. we have an, what we call an MDEL medical establishment, uh, medical device establishment license yeah. through Health Canada. Yeah. So we can sell in Canada and train in Canada, but okay. we do have a sister company, as I was mentioning. We were, I was just down in Nashville, and there. So the U.S. company is called Coromed. Okay. And uh, that is cool of a name. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we work with them for the U.S., and then we have uh, another twenty companies on a global uh, scale. So we wow. have you know companies in Belgium, uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Finland, Germany, uh, soon to be Italy, I believe, U.K., wow. um, uh, Ireland. So we're kind of we're trying, and we're growing. 
Yeah, that's really cool. As, like, how many years has it been? It's been what more more than twenty years at this point that you've been growing the same business, and it's it's crazy that people might think, yeah, yeah, I've tapped out the market, but you've expanded way beyond probably what you could even see as a firefighter. Yeah, you know, when we first started, uh, especially on the product side with defibrillators, when we first started those, you know, it was a B, it was a B2B market. I yeah. was going into corporations, the, you know, workplaces, et cetera, uh, associations, uh, uh, fitness clubs, putting them in. But the, the, as we grew, and especially in the last couple of years, I'm really trying to expand this to the B2C market. Okay. Because at the consumer level, uh, the statistics show that most cardiac arrests 70% of the time through the heart and stroke uh, statistics here in Canada, over 70% of the time they happen in a home setting. Wow. With, to a loved one. Okay. So I'm a believer that you should have a defibrillator in your house, just like a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. should have one in your cottage. should have one in the car if you can, if you can afford it. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, one in uh, your, your sailboat if you're going sailing on Lake Ontario or wherever you may be. Because mm -hmm. um, you never know when you're going to need it. Um, so, yeah, I'd really like to see it get to that to that you know, consumer level where people are buying them for, for, for their homes. Wow. Now, John, how has your role changed? You know, so these days, like you mentioned, you're sitting in an office, but as it went global, like what, what are some of the responsibilities um, that have kind of fallen into your new role as leader of an organization that's global? How did, like, how did you even go global? Like, what? Well, I, I didn't go global. It okay. was uh, as a group out of uh, Sweden called okay. Safe Life, okay. and they uh, they were growing in Europe, okay. going around to different countries and and aligning themselves with companies such as mine. Mm -hmm. When they got to Germany, I know a good friend of mine who has a company over in Germany that is very similar to what we're doing here in Canada, and uh, they had asked him. They said, "We want to go into North America. How do we do it?" Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Volker said, "I think you should talk to John over in Canada. I think he might be able to help." So these guys from Sweden came to visit me and, uh, you know, we had other organizations uh, knocking on the door, wanting to team up and all that. And um, the, it was the best fit for us to go with Safe Life. Yeah. And uh, I've never looked back. It's been fantastic. Uh, it was December 2021 20, oh, that okay. we aligned ourselves with them. Wow. And uh, so we're now under their ownership on a global level. Wow. So what, what does that actually mean when you say like, we're now under their ownership under a global level? Like, is it, are you like overseeing operations in different countries? Like how does that? No, I'm overseeing Canada for Rescue 7 as the okay. CEO. Okay. Uh, and then we have three other companies now that have now been purchased in Canada with us. Okay. So we have. So you guys, Rescue 7 purchased other companies? Not a Safe Life. Safe Life. Safe, safe Life. Are you like them. a partner at Safe Life? Uh, we, so I'm not, I'm, uh, uh, um, I have shares in Safe Life. Yeah. Um, so I, I have some kind of ownership. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of us have uh, shares with the with the with the parent company with okay. the parent, uh, parent team. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, we purchased a group uh, out of uh, Montreal called Cardio Shock. Oh, wow. So they handle the Montreal uh, territory for us. We have two other companies, Heart Zap here in, in Ontario, which actually is, uh, they, uh, we're just talking about merging them and us together. Okay. And then we have AED for Life, which is, uh, they were up there with myself in the past as being the largest distributors for defibrillators in Canada. Wow, congrats, man, you're holding the, you're, you're holding the trophy right now. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got a good team we've assembled here mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're assembling a similar team down in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to grow. It. So we have the North American market yeah. and then uh, the team over in Europe. So we're, we're growing. Wow. At the time, you know, when you first started, their, your vision was probably like, how do I just teach as many people as possible? Now, after you've climbed that mountain and you've got a machine behind you that's teaching people at all times, right? Like we, we walked in here today and there's a class going on in the room right beside us. Um, what are, what mountains are you climbing these days? Uh, to grow the, you know, grow more. Just grow. See how yeah, we got it. Well, again, the, the, you know, there's lots of opportunity here to put the fibrillators at the consumer. I really want to get them out there into people's homes. Yeah. Um, you know, I said the stats about, you know, over 70% and, and you got minutes before they'll actually die on you. Mm -hmm. Um, when, you know, I'm hearing, so we have a, a uh, uh, annual meetings coming up next week. Yeah. Or actually this week. Yeah. It's Crazy this week. Fast time flies. And uh, <laughs> so our team from around Canada will be in uh, starting Wednesday for Wednesday, Thursday meetings. And then on Friday, we have a winter carnival. Mm. And I started the winter carnival nine years ago, actually 10 years ago. This is our eighth annual. We lost two years because of the pandemic, unfortunately. 
um, started it because we wanted to get the community more involved so that they learn more about these defibrillators and what we're doing with them. Okay. And so what we did, we thought, well, how do we get them involved mm -hmm. and get their attention? So we said, well, why don't we have a winter carnival and run a ski day? Mm. So we ran out a private ski resort. At, it's called the Heights uh, uh, Ski Resort, just uh, north of Barrie. It's okay. right across the road from Horseshoe Valley. Okay. And we invite suppliers, clients, colleagues, families, friends, kids, enemies, whoever. We want them to come to this day and we charge, you know, $30 at the door. Yeah. Very, it's very modest. It's cheaper uh, than a lift ticket. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that includes your skiing for the day. We have horse-drawn sleigh rides, pancake breakfast, silent auction, live auction. We have uh, beer and wine tasting okay. uh, for the adults. We have uh, a live band that evening and all the, and then we have a puck drop that day, which is the kids love. So as they go up the ski hill, they got to drop a puck into a bucket down below them. And if they get it in, then we call them up to the stage at the end of the day and whoever last puck we pull out, they win a prize. Uh, last year was, uh, it was uh, a bicycle. The year before it was leaf tickets. Wow. I believe this year it's going to be an Austin Matthews jersey. Nice. And so we do different things. Um, but each year at our event, we have a survivor come to, to speak for us. Wow. So this year we're going to have a 63-year-old gentleman that was, uh, was saved by a defibrillator at a home hardware store in Peterborough, Ontario. Global Crazy. TV ran a whole uh, new segment on it. Wow. And I've asked him if he would come and speak for us about what he experienced going through that. Wow. And I think it helps because when people then, you know, we usually get about two, 200 plus people at our event. When they hear survive, somebody talk about they were saved with a defibrillator, they wouldn't Different. be here today if it wasn't for that defibrillator. Yeah. The whole room goes silent and they see how impactful it is yeah. and they see what we're trying to do now. Wow. And so, it, you know, again, it makes the hair on my arm stand up when I hear these stories. Yeah. Um, about these, uh, the year before we had a survivor who was playing goalie 60-year-old gentleman. He was a goaltender in a Sunday morning men's league. Mm -hmm. And he went down cardiac arrest. And the timekeeper was a 17-year-old girl, girl at the time. And she was just trained in high school how to do CPR and, and work in the field there. No way. So she ran out on the ice told somebody, one of the players to go call 911, called, told the other to get C, the, the defibrillator for her. She started CPR, shocked this guy twice, and they both came to our event last year and and, wow. and, uh, and did a speech for us. Wow. And how, you know, again, how impactful is that? Mm -hmm. And that that young girl, 17, she went on to become a nurse. Wow. So I think she found her, you know, her destiny when she, uh, yeah. when that happened. But it's, you know, um, I just, you know, I, I can't, say enough about how important these machines are yeah. and how easy they are to use. Mm -hmm. So the more we can get them everywhere, the more lives we save. Wow, John, I think it's a, it's a very important mission that you're on. And I, I'm, I'm honored to be sitting here with you to, to learn more about the story. This is, this is really cool to see how it's shaped. And like you go into stores all the time and you see defibrillators and to think, and they're just things that you never think of, right? It's like, oh yeah, this machine's here, but you know, it's somebody's mission to put them there. And it's somebody's mission to save those lives. You know, we go into hotels that we work with, fitness clubs, et cetera. And when they put one on a wall, you know, at the reception in the hotel or at mm -hmm. the customer service in the fitness club, uh, I'll get a call from the general manager and say, do you know how many comments we got about that? Really? What do they say? They'll say, I can't believe you have a defibrillator here. That's really great. So you care about us. Wow. And uh, I'm so glad it's here. Huh. And so that, you know, it works well for them as well. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. very good investment for them. Wow. Um, yeah, we had one fitness club that's now, I think they've had over, I don't, I, I believe, I know the numbers, but it's over 100 saves in the 10, over the 10-year program. That what kind of workout are they program. putting people through? <laughs> that's cool. So you never know, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's, uh, the more we can get them out there, I mean, you know, we, everybody has a fire extinguisher. Yeah. And I always ask people being a, you know, a former firefighter, if your house was, you know, the kitchen was on fire and it's going pretty good, what are you going to do? And they automatically say, I'm going to run out of the house. Yeah. So you're not going to grab the fire extinguisher? Uh-huh. So they don't think about it. Listen, we can always rebuild homes. Uh -huh. You can't rebuild a life. You get wow. one chance. Wow. You know, can't make them any debtor. And if we bring them back, then, you know, they got a second lease on life now. Wow. John, thank you so much for sharing. So if you were to go back to the old firefighter, John, you know, who's thinking about starting this mission, who hasn't necessarily made the jump yet, you know, or the one who might have said, oh, my wife's not giving me Uncle Ron's number. <laughs> you know, maybe I might stop this thing. You know, what would you tell him? Oh, listen, uh, firefighting is an most, I, and my hat's off to every firefighter, every paramedic, every police officer, every military, et cetera, out there. It's a, it's a very courageous job and they do a great job. And 
it allowed me to do what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. It gave me that stepping stone. And if I wasn't there doing that career, I, yeah, Rescue 7 wouldn't have, I mean, the, the, the truck now has been decommissioned and there's no more Rescue 7 out there. So I kept the name living, but uh, it allowed me this opportunity. I'm very grateful to, that I was able to be a firefighter. Wow, John, thank you so much for sharing. Any last words that you wanna share with the younger John, with the younger generation, with the future business owners and people that are looking to change the world? I, yeah, again, you know, there's, there's, I think we got, uh, especially the young, younger generation, there's so many talented people out there and it's such a great honor to be able to work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have great business people, we have great entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I say to those people, the entrepreneurs especially, if you're going after something, it's obviously gotta be a passion, so just keep going after it and uh, you know, doing the best you can, because it'll get there. If, you, if you're a believer in it, that dream will come true, I think. Beauty. Well, John, thank you so much for saving lives. We really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. And uh, that, that concludes another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. We're sitting down with none other than John Coley, the founder of Rescue 7 and the saver of many lives. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode. Peace.